shame about that Watson boy. Such a promising kid. Fastest thing I ever did see in this town. Could have been famous. Yep. Wasn't he president of his school? Yep. What did I do? Yep. Murder. Why? Why? Watson, Charles Watson, of course, what is it? Is it you have it? Is it? Watson, Charles Watson, report to the visiting room. You have a visit. Hello. Glad to finally meet you. Why don't we have a seat over here? You'll have to forgive me for being kind of nervous. This is a nervous kind of place. I'm sorry my wife wasn't able to be here today. Oh, that's all right. I hope you didn't mind my letters. Oh, I didn't want to just show up here and have you wondering who is this stranger. No, I didn't mind at all. The trick is trying to find the time to read them. <laughs> so, how did you hear about me? Well, uh, I was in Southern California around the time you were, and I followed your story for a while. But I'd rather hear your story straight from you. Well, I grew up in Copeville, Texas. It's a very small town, about an hour from Dallas. My brother and my sister and I were all raised to be good kids. I was the youngest. Children, you better finish getting ready for church now. I didn't like church much. I liked sports. I did everything from football to basketball, but track was my sport. Congratulations, Charles. Thanks, Coach. You set a record today that may not be broken for years. Yeah, sure. No, I'm serious. I got a feeling that you're going to make this town famous one of these days. What are you looking at? See that crossroad down there? Yeah. That's when there's rotten egg. <laughs> Watson blows the competition away. Test your weight, Charles. Someday. Someday. Yeah. Someday. Someday we're going to get out of here, Billy. And where are we going? I don't know. Out. Away. Don't you get sick of this town? Don't you get tired of everybody knowing you? You knowing everyone? Oh, you love your fame and you know it. No, I'm serious, man. There's so much more to this world than this stupid little town. Don't you just want to get out there and discover it? So when did your life start going downhill? It was a combination of many things. Even though I did well in school and everything, it was never good enough. My brother was always better. I felt like a failure, like there was this void in my life. I tried to fill it myself, but I made all the wrong choices. In college, I was finally on my own and I could do whatever I wanted. But the things I thought I wanted were a fraternity, beer, women. It's good to see you. You know, to be cool. I think the first time I really did anything bad was when I stole a typewriter for a frat initiation. I mean, when I look back, it was stupid. But everyone was laughing. I felt big and important. Somebody get that? It's Charles, it's for you. Thank you, babe. Hello? Mom? Look, can I call you back later? Yeah, I know it's late. No, Mom, she's just a girl. Okay, okay. listen, I'm going to call you back tomorrow, all right? I will. Okay, Mom. Bye, Mom. 
How's the party, everybody? It's great, boss. Oh, great party, Charles. Yeah, thanks. What's going on, man? Didn't you have fun? Yeah, I guess. I'm just tired. Tired of small towns. Tired of college. I just want more, you know? Yeah, sure. I know. What do I have to complain about, right? I'm just not happy, man. I know there's something else out there. I gotta find it. California. That's it. I've always wanted to go there. My parents begged me to stay, but getting out was the only answer at the time. I wanted to live my own life. I hadn't lived up to my parents' expectations. So I just rebelled and ran, hoping that things would change. Well, what was it you were looking for all that time? I wasn't sure. Some sort of freedom, I guess. I figured I'd know when I found it. I had a good friend from college in L.A. He always invited me out, so one day I just showed up on his doorstep and he let me stay. Next thing I knew, I was smoking dope. How do you feel, man? Well, I can't feel my legs. I can't feel your legs either. <laughs> this is pretty good. <laughs> Smoking pot was easy to do. Everybody was doing it, and it was just the next step down. When I smoked pot, I felt like I was accepted and loved. But it never lasted. And then what happened? And then I met the man who would introduce me to Charlie Manson. Thanks, man. I was beginning to think this was going to be a real bad evening. No problem. My name's Charles. Dennis Wilson. Hey, I do. I really appreciate this. Sure. Dennis Wilson. That sounds familiar. I'm one of the Beach Boys. No way. Yeah. Let me prove it to you. Why don't you come over to my house? I'm having a party, and you can meet some friends of mine. Okay, I dig it. That sounds groovy. Hey, Dennis, where you been? Hey, I had to go into town. I could have driven you. Oh, that's all right. I wouldn't have had a chance to meet Charles here. Charles, this is Dean, former minister, now guru, whatever you are. <laughs> nice to meet you. What are you, anyways? <laughs> Who's here already? Charlie's here. Who's Charlie? Come on, I'll introduce you. Come on. What so few people understood about Charlie was that the first time any of us ever met him, he was a completely different person than what the general public saw. He was peaceful. He was love. He had power. Power to deceive. Do you know what family is, Charles? Yeah, sure. No, I'm speaking about an eternal family. A group of people that you can love for that reason and be with without reservation. You know what I'm talking about? I think so. See, I'm talking about a family that loves you. I see you and I love you for who you are. See, you're just a dove that wants to fly, but you can't fly because your wings are broke. And who broke them? The system, man. You ever seen a lizard surf? A lizard surf? Yeah, man. A lizard surf. It's beautiful, man, because I can see it. I'm not in the system. The system's not part of me. And I, I look out past the fog and I can see the lizard surf. And it's beautiful, man. Because when you do see it, it all makes sense. And there's just peace. The whole night was really an eye-opening experience. I felt at peace for the first time around these people. When I saw Charlie, I realized that all the love in the room was coming from him, from his music. I love you.
love you. So you went back to see him? Dennis invited everyone back. And since Dean ran the place when Dennis was gone on tour, I came all the time. Dean became my best friend, and there were always girls there to take care of us. Pretty soon I moved in. At the time, I couldn't believe that I'd ever want to go home. You got into some other drugs, too, didn't you? Yeah. Dean took me on my first acid trip. Each one of us has an ego, a desire to assert ourselves. We hang on to that ego, thinking that without it, we won't survive. But what Charlie is saying... With acid, I began to experience again the feeling of tremendous love that I had felt the first time I met Charlie. Charlie gave what seemed like unconditional love. That's what I'd always wanted. It was at these times that I became the most vulnerable, because I wanted so much to be a part of something. Charlie made an incredible impression on me, but I just wasn't quite ready to give in. And then time ended. What do you mean? Well, at the end of the summer, Dean was harassing some of the girls at the house, so Dennis kicked us out. Hey. I had nowhere to go, so I went with Dean on a trip to Northern California to pay for some ticket. That morning was the first time we went to Terry Melcher's house. That's where Sharon Tate was murdered. Most people didn't realize that. The first night of the murders wasn't random. I'd been there two previous times. After your trip up north, then what did you do? I went to Charlie. to live, don't you? I look at you, Charles, and I don't like what I see. I see a man unwilling to die to himself. Now, how can I let something like that infest my family? I need a place to stay, Charlie. I know I can become all you talk about. Please just give me a chance. I look at you, Charles. And I love you. Why? I love you in spite of all your self-centered ego. Charlie. Charlie, when will we be ready? How will we know when we've died to ourselves completely? I will be the judge of you. You can't know when that time will come. But when it does come, I will be the first one to love you only. But how will we know that you know? Why do you question me? Why don't you trust me? It's times like these that prove to me that you still must learn more. I will prove myself to you. I can see. You don't know that, but I can see. Oh, see what? with a large amount of grass. You will see him and you will know this to be true. Then you will know of me. Hey guys, it's Christmas time and I'm Santa Claus. ever knew if Charlie had rigged the whole situation or not. To me, it was just another example of his power. I was in awe, and it only helped to reinforce the feelings I had toward Charlie. He was Jesus Christ. <laughs> Charlie was 
was singing Die Today, and we all followed right along. I think we all thought of it as some kind of new religion, and Charlie was our savior. If there was a problem, we would find ways to believe, even when we didn't. But what was Charlie getting out of it? Manipulation, sex. A lot of the girls would have done anything for him. The most important thing on Charlie's mind, though, was his singing career. Terry Melcher had promised Charlie a chance to prove his talent. But it was obvious from the start that Charlie was not very good. Wasn't Charlie just so perfect when he sang? I have never heard him sing so beautifully before. I love Charlie when he sings. They'd be insane not to like Charlie. Charlie was so mad when his chance fell through. I want to be a monkey. You are. <laughs> well, we're all monkeys. Completely uninhibited and totally free. Nothing can stop us. Drugs were a big part of our lives. I remember one time on an acid trip, we thought we were monkeys. up getting arrested. The press later used my mugshot to depict me. Charlie! Charlie! What? Greg's in jail. Greg was a producer who had set up the studio audition for Charlie Manson. Charlie asked me to go back to Terry to ask for the bail money. Your text, right? Hi, Terry. Charlie sent me to ask you a little favor. Did you know Greg's in jail? Well, we need to get him out, and we don't have any money. That's too bad, uh... I guess you're out of luck. Well, Charlie was kind of hoping you'd help us out. I'm, I'm sorry, Tex. I, I just don't have any money right now, and uh, everything I've got is tied up. What about all this? You could give us, like, like this silver. What about uh, that? No, I'm, sure I'm that afraid would cover not. It. See, uh, this house ain't mine. In fact, none of this stuff's mine. Oh, yeah. Terry had his driver take me back in his fancy car. I thought, it's just like Charlie said, we would gladly give our lives for each other, and Terry won't even help his friend. By that time, something deep down inside of me was trying to get out. I had to leave, I thought, just to keep from suffocating. Hey, Tex, here it is. This is our answer. Charlie thought the Beatles were sending him messages through their White Album. That night, I slipped out the back door and left. I stayed with some friends, but Charlie kept tugging at my soul. I kept switching back and forth in my mind. I wanted my identity, but I loved Charlie and his ways. I want to come back, Charlie. I want to come back to the family. Look at you and your wretched clothes. I should never accept you back into the family. I don't think you could be one of us, so get out of here! Go on, get! I can't, get. Charlie. I know I Get out of here! Please! Just give me a chance! All right, I'll let you back in. You can be of use to us for the final plan. Helter Skelter is coming down, Tex. Helter Skelter is what this is all about. When that sky opens up, you'll be one of us. Now go on over there and work on that dune buggy. Come on. You should see yourself, Tex. What's Helter Skelter? The end of the world, and Charlie has it all figured out. Come on.
Revolution 9, Revelation 9, don't you see? The four angels were the four beetles, see? Locust beetles. They prepare the way for Christ. I will lead you. Charlie's new teachings were all about Armageddon. He called it Helter Skelter, the ultimate battle between blacks and whites in which the entire white race would be annihilated. What gave us hope was Charlie's plan of salvation. Just before the Great War, Charlie would lead the family out into the desert to the bottomless pit. Blackie would rise up, take over the earth, and then become lazy. They'd need a leader. Charlie honestly felt he'd rise up out of the pit and lead the world. So follow me. Rise. 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 Charlie had even more power with his hope for salvation to a better life. Charlie gave us a purpose that kept us going. It worked. We were all hooked. Right. What you writing, Charlie? Charlie, what you writing? I'm writing a plan. What's the plan, Charlie? Revolution, man. Don't you get it? It's about the revolution that the Beatles are asking for. Don't you see? My songs are going to be the hymns of the future. As soon as Terry gets a hold of the... Wait a minute. You talked to Terry? Yeah, man. He told me that he would personally come up here and listen. Listen to this. As we return, and you will fall, and you will burn, and you will call. We are the chosen from the mist. I am your leader from the abyss. Terry never came. It was around that time that Charlie started to program us for killing. We would play mock games about killing piggies. One person would play the piggy, and everyone else would practice killing him. We'd laugh and cheer when each person would do it. I remember we used to play games in the neighborhoods. We'd break into people's houses in the middle of the night and rearrange things. Why? Charlie wanted to take away our fear, to completely remove any kind of fear that we had so that we would have no hesitation. If we weren't scared, we wouldn't stop to think about it. We'd usually drop a tab of acid during the whole process, and when we would come down, Charlie would very softly talk about things that might happen. Like what? Things like tying him up, stabbing him. I'm sorry. No, continue, please. The thing about the games was that even though they ended, the images that we created stayed with us. How was Charlie Manson able to get you to murder for him? Well, the nights of the Tate and LaBianca murders were not the first time it happened. To finance Helter Skelter, I ripped off a drug dealer, and he threatened to kill me. So Charlie paid him a little visit. Big Crow. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Sit down. I told you to sit down. <laughs> Funny, huh? <laughs> <laughs> the second was a guy by the name of Gary Hinman. When he wouldn't give them anything, they killed him. Where's your money, Gary? Charlie's waiting. I'm angry. Why are you angry, Charlie? What did we do? I'm angry at the blackie. I put my trust in the Blackie, and look what happens when you put your trust in someone who's not a part of the family. They just let you down. It's just like Terry Melcher. Maybe it's not time. It is time. It, it's time for the revolution. Everything's right. Everything's perfect. It's, it's just like the setting of the sun. It's... Right, whatever. I want you to do something for me, Ted. But you may not like.
I want you to kill for me. Will you do that? Yeah. that we all told charlie we felt nothing no remorse no guilt but inside we were hurting charlie had helped to kill all kinds of feelings but still i had done something that i felt sick about then why did it stop i told charlie that i'd called my parents and that the fbi was looking for me i thought if i didn't do something there'd be more murders that did stop the killing Charlie decided to take us all to the desert again to look for the bottomless pit. What would you do if I were to take this knife and I started towards you and I were going to kill you? I'd fight back, man. I'd try to stop you. <laughs> what about you, Tex? Would you die for me? Would you let me kill you? Sure, Charlie. You can kill me. If you would do anything for Charlie, why weren't you with him when he was arrested? Charlie wanted me to kill again. I couldn't do it. When I came off the drugs, I had this sick feeling inside. I realized how wrong it was to kill. And Helter Skelter wasn't coming down like Charlie said it would either. I had to get away from him. So I ran and went home to Texas. Charlie and the others were arrested, and it didn't take long for the police to catch up with me, too. After about a year, I was extradited to California for my trial. The defendant shall rise. The jury finds the defendant guilty on seven counts of first-degree murder and one count of conspiracy to commit murder. At one point, I was very sick, and the thoughts going through my mind, the memories the guilt they came close to driving me crazy I started reading a Bible my mother had sent me but I didn't really understand what it said but I did begin to see my victims as real terrified men and women the impact of what I had done started to become real but reading the Bible did bring some peace then the Supreme Court withdrew the death penalty I deserved the death penalty, but I was transferred from death row in San Quentin to serve out my life sentence here at the California Men's Colony. God kept tugging at me to turn to him. As I read my Bible more, I began to realize that Jesus was not some man who manipulated people into killing for him. Jesus Christ was God's son. But I still saw my relationship with God in terms of what he was giving me, and not what I should be giving to him. My whole self, and all rights to it. Hey, Jesus loves you, man. The closer I got to really trusting in Jesus Christ, the more frightened I became. Was he going to be different than the last Savior I'd followed? Jesus Christ has given me reason to go on living. I've never experienced such real joy and, and peace until I accepted Christ. God forgives us for all our sins. He's made me a new person. I've given everything to Christ, not just my problems and needs, but everything. I wanted to be a new person, but as I read the Bible more, I felt more guilt because of my crimes. Could a person like me be forgiven? One Sunday, I really felt like I needed to go to the chapel service. Introducing Reverend DeVito. 
Good morning, gentlemen. It's good to be here this morning. Let's turn to our Bibles to 1 Timothy, and I'm going to read from this text in 1 Timothy. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now listen to this. Of whom I am the worst. For this reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Let me tell you something about this man, Paul. Paul was a headstrong person, a violent man. And he did all of this in the name of his religion. One day as he was persecuting and pursuing Christians, he had an encounter with Jesus Christ. This Jesus Christ appeared to Paul. Now this encounter was no mere turning of the corner in some spiritual journey for Paul. It was running head on into a wall. His life shattering in pieces. Now God is able to take this man, Paul, this blasphemer, this persecutor, this violent man, and put him back together piece by piece. There's forgiveness available for him. Listen to what else the scripture says. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me Finally, abundantly. I realized God's forgiveness was big enough for Paul and even for me. All I had to do was accept it. So I did. God really has brought you so far. He has really given you a new life in Christ. And it's true that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. I've shown that by coming here to you today. Susan, you've had a lot of questions. I hope you don't mind me asking you one. Why did you come here to see me today? When I came here today, I wasn't sure if I was going to tell you this or not, but... But what? Well, I, I want you to know I didn't intend to deceive you by not telling you this before I came. Okay. What is it? Well... Rosemary LaBianca was my mother. You're kidding. No, I'm not. Hold on. You're trying to tell me that you're Rosemary LaBianca's daughter? Yes. I killed her parents. I didn't know what to think of you, Charles. I needed to know for myself if you really were a Christian. But after talking to you, I have no doubt. I want you to know that I have no resentment toward you. <laughs> 